It was September 15, 2011, a day of celebration and great achievement. Year 2011 marked the 50th celebration of African American achievement on campus, when the first student enrolled at UT Martin. Summer of 1961 marked the beginning of desegregation at the University of Tennessee at Martin, when an African-American woman and Martin native named Jessie Lou Arnold arrived on campus. While her time here was not filled with fond memories, Miss Arnold did pave the way for all the other African-American students who would set foot on this campus. The university's dean, Dr. Paul Meek, approached Miss Arnold's mother in the spring of 1961 to ask if her daughter would like to attend UT Martin to help begin the process of desegregation at the university. Reverend Harold Connor, her school principal, who later became the first African-American administrator in 1969, also encouraged her. Miss Arnold was 16 years old when she agreed to take on this important, but soon difficult task. Dr. Meek asked Ms. Arnold to live on campus and gave her the choice of where she would like to live, the new or old section of Clement. During her sophomore year, 1962 to 63, she lived in the newly renovated section of Clement Hall. She did not have a roommate, nor did she make any friends. However, a few girls would sit and talk with her while they were in the lounge. She entered college not really knowing what types of careers were available. She had only seen ministers, nurses, teachers, and a doctor in her ethnic group. Therefore, from the list she decided to get her degree in education because that is all she really knew. She really did not have anyone on campus whom she could call her mentor, but her favorite professor was her French professor, Dr. Muriel Tomlinson. She went on to teach senior French when she did her student teaching at her old high school. On June 3, 1965, Miss Arnold became the second African-American graduate from UT Martin and was the first to complete a full student career at the institution. She went on to the University of Illinois to get her master's. She was married to Paul Pryor, who was a student at UT Martin, for one year. She and Mr. Pryor became the first African-Americans to join the UT Martin Choir. Miss Jessie Lou Arnold Pryor was instrumental in shaping this campus into what it has become today. We honor her for her strength and perseverance. Miss Beverly Polk Eccles began her journey at the University of Tennessee at Martin when she transferred here from Lemoyne Owen College in 1962. Her father decided he wanted her to attend UT Martin after he heard that another African American student, Miss Jessie Lou Arnold Pryor, was attending. Later during school, Miss Pryor and she would have lunch together. Her father worked in Martin at the time, and while she attended school, she lived with him. School began, and Miss Eccles' first day at UT Martin had arrived. The teachers were all very nice to her, but she felt lonely on her first day. Other students eventually would talk to her if they felt that they couldn't be seen. However, the married women on campus would always talk to her. Her fondest memory is how kind they were to her. One day, she didn't have a ride to a function that she was required to attend. Then, one of the married women offered her a ride and she felt such relief and kindness. Her other fond memories of campus were the arrival of more African-American students. 
Also, while she was attending school, she student taught at the elementary school in Martin, where Reverend Harold Connor was principal. She student taught under his wife, Miss Florence Connor. Two years later, in June 1964, Miss Eccles reached the end of her career at UT Martin, becoming the university's first African American graduate. She graduated with a degree in elementary education. When she got out of the car that day, proud, with her gown wrapped on her arm, a stranger said kind words to her. Young lady, young lady, I just want to commend you. You did a wonderful job graduating from here. After graduating, Miss Eccles pursued her career in elementary education. She always knew that she wanted to be a teacher. Her favorite grade to teach was first grade because she had a true passion for teaching small children and watching them learn. She first taught in the Memphis City School System for 35 years. Then she taught four more years in the Mississippi School System. She has three children, two daughters, and one son. Her daughters followed in their mother's footsteps and became teachers. The night before the celebration, we welcomed one of our honorees. After 50 years of a long overdue acknowledgement, Jessie Lou Arnold Pryor stepped foot again on campus with her family by her side. During the dinner, her story was told for the first time on campus. Also, she was given a gift, a model of the administration building. The administration building used to hold the education classes on the third floor. In this building, she would often at times run into Chancellor Paul Meek on her way to and from class. It was the day of the big celebration. Miss Beverly Polk Eccles set foot on campus again for the first time since graduation 47 years ago. Miss Eccles and Miss Pryor were reunited after attending UT Martin together. Finally, we were able to welcome both of our honorees of the day. The day began, of course, with breakfast. What else? The breakfast was hosted by the city of Barton, where the mayor, Randy Brandage, and city council members were in attendance. During the breakfast, Mr. David Belote read the city proclamation. The proclamation recognized the honorees not only for their academic achievement, but their influence on the community. The mayor of the city of Martin encouraged all citizens to show appreciation for their courage and efforts in making their university and our community a better place. Folks, it takes some strength to come back to a situation it was not perfect when you were in it, and allow folks to honor you. It's tough, and there are a lot of people who will not do that. They, it just doesn't happen. So we're, we're honored that you would come and let us entertain you a bit and celebrate you. Uh, even though 50 years ago this wasn't in the picture, well, it's way past you. My memory, because I left in 1965, is like a snapshot in time. Yeah. And back then we were colored, you know, and because uh, Subway Carmichael didn't coin the term black power until 1966, that was after I left here, so I was still colored when I left here. And I remember we had colored restrooms, and there were water fountains that I learned not to go anywhere near when I was very young. And I, I remember that we had colored waiting, waiting rooms in the doctor's office. And uh, we had colored waiting rooms at the train station in Fulton, North Tennessee, or Kentucky. And there was, um, I couldn't, I, I know there was tennis courts and uh, swimming pools and a public library, but I couldn't go there. And there was this little park, I think just at the end of town where they had some seats and a fountain you could walk through, but my mother told me you're not supposed to sit down on that bench that was there. You know, and so I was thinking about all of those things and kind of remember that that's my memory of Martin when I was leaving. But there's also another Martin that I remember. I remember Martin where the white grocery store downtown would call my mother when the fresh produce came in and ask, what do you want me to put aside for you? I also remember a Martin where the owner of one of the dress shops, I Mary Lee, Mrs. Elliott, she used to keep my mother and me in mind when she'd go to New York buying drips. She would call my mom, and my mom would 
go and the store would be closed and she'd knock on the window and she would open the store and we would go in and she would have put my mom in her best dressing room, which of course she'd never put my mom in when the store was open. That was the one with the mirrors. I was little, but I remember that was the one with the mirrors and even a sofa there and I could play in the corner and she'd bring clothes in for my mother to try on. And, um, I, you know, that's, that's a very fond memory. But I also remember the white doctor who came after Dr. Lay died, he was our black doctor. I remember he, him coming to our house in the middle of the night when my mother was so ill. And I remember him calling the pharmacist who was in bed and making arrangements for me to go to that pharmacist's house and pick up uh, a prescription. So, because back then, uh, drugstores were closed on Sunday. And she would have had to wait till Monday morning to start a medication. And I went late that night, maybe by a taxi. We got everybody out of bed because the taxi driver was white too. To go and pick up the medicine at the pharmacist's house. And I also remember a white businessman who, without hesitance, gave my mother a loan to rebuild our home when, the, when our home was infested with termites and it had to be torn down. So I say all that to say that it's a snapshot in time, but there was two Martins there. Amen. There were two Martins there. And in all of our lives, no matter who we are, our heritage, or where we come from, we have things in our lives that bring us down, and we have things in our lives that lift us up. And it takes both of those things that give us inspiration in our lives. And with that inspiration, if we use it right, we can, it's, every day is a new day to make a difference. And so, to the city of Martin, I want you to know that 50 years ago, you made a difference in my life, and today, you've made a difference in my life. And I thank you. Then the day continued with more conversation. Several students from Dr. David Barber's history class were chosen to participate in a Q&A with the honorees about their experiences here on campus. Mr. Theotis Robinson, one of the first African-American undergraduate students at UT Knoxville, was also in attendance. Well, I'm happy also to be here. This is the first really visit I had since I left in 1964. I briefly came through Martin, Tennessee in the late 60s, and that was it. So when I came back yesterday, this campus seemed so different. I didn't see anything that I recognized from when I was here before. And I did see a lot of students walking around. My daughter and I, we drove around for quite a while just looking at the campus. And I kept saying to her, Carla, I don't see any buildings that I recognize when I was here. And so I asked this morning about the gym that used to be across the street from the administration building, if it was still there. And he said yes, but it had been remodeled. So I'm just happy to be back today. And I want to say this, I didn't ever think I would say that, that I'm happy to be back at UT Mom. <laughs> <laughs> but I am. Okay. I'm Theotis Robinson. In the summer of 1960, and I graduated from high school in 1960, I sent a letter of application to attend the University of Tennessee. Uh, back then, it was not University of Tennessee, Knoxville, it was just the University of Tennessee. I received a letter back saying that we're sorry, but we do not admit, quote, Negroes to the undergraduate school. The graduate school had been desegregated as a result of a lawsuit that had been filed in 1949-1950 in that time frame, but it didn't affect the undergraduate school. So I wrote a subsequent letter, asked for a meeting uh, with the gentleman in the admissions office who had sent the letter to me denying my admission uh, for a meeting uh, for my parents and me uh, with them. Went over, we went over and met with them. <clears throat> They were very polite, even cordial, but said there was nothing that they could do about it. Wanted to know if uh, my parents and I would like to meet with the president of the university, a man by the name of Dr. Andy Holt, 
a name I'm certain that many of you have heard. <clears throat> we told them that yes, we would like to meet with Dr. Holt. They scheduled a meeting and my parents and I went and sat down with him. He wanted to know why did I want to come to the University of Tennessee. I explained to him that what I wanted to major in, which was political science, was not offered at the school where I had intended to go. I can only minor in uh, poli sci. And besides, I was a Tennessean by birth and by residence and had a right to attend the public university of the state of Tennessee. <clears throat> he said there was, any, there was not anything that he could do about it. Only the board of trustees could deal with it. Did we want him to take the matter to the board? We told him that yes, we would like for him to do that. He said he couldn't assure us what action the board might take. Uh, we told him that we understood that, but the board and he needed to understand if they did not change the policy, we plan to sue the university. The matter went before the board on November 18, 1960. They brought the state attorney general from the state of Tennessee in to ask him if he thought he could win such a lawsuit. He told them that he didn't think so, that he could not win such a lawsuit because there was so much case law being established in similar situations. So they deliberated further and, and voted to change the policy and I was admitted and enrolled January 4th of 1961. Two other students then came in. It was very ironic that 40 years later, the Board of Trustees met and acted and I was named Vice President for the University of Tennessee System for Equity and Diversity. So I work with all of the campuses across the UT system and it's been quite an interesting journey. Like Jesse and I know like Beverly, I asked Jesse this question last night, I hadn't asked Beverly, but I'm sure I know what her answer would be. In 1961, did you think you'd ever be sitting here today at UT Martin celebrating your entry and your time spent here? And I'm pretty certain that actually no, be no. I did not think that. <laughs> so, and that was the same for me. So I'm glad to be here, I'm glad to be back on the UT Martin campus. Were you bitter at any time after coming here and be like, Feeling, I guess feeling unwanted or some type of unwanted. Were you ever for for a certain time? You ever feel bitter about about being here at all? I wouldn't say bitter. I w I had a lot of sad moments while I was here. I say that because people was all around me and I was by myself, even though I was around a lot of people. Now that was sad for me, very sad. The time that was most frustrating was the first day of class, I think, because um, I knew where to go, and I, I went there and I arrived 30 minutes early. And I, I went in and I sat down in the second row from the front, uh, and I um, waited. And about 10 minutes before classes started, the white students started to come in. And I think taking a cue from the first ones that entered, they all formed a line around the perimeter of the room. And, they, and so I was the only one seated in the room. Um, and we waited. The, the instructor arrived on time. And he wa went to the blackboard. And he wrote on the blackboard, Dr. Hoffman, History 101. And he turned around and he said something to this effect. Um, I've been hired to teach this class. I will teach it whether there's one or 100. If you want to take this class, please take a seat. If you don't, please leave now. And I sat there. It was, it was a humiliating kind of thing. You, you, you're embarrassed. You're not really sure what to do. I really just stared straight ahead and waited because I didn't know if the students were going to leave the room, <coughs> if any were going to sit down, what was going to happen. I, I, I had visions of just the instructor myself being there for the term <laughs> after he said that. But um, they gradually began to take a seat. But when they were all seated, I had a seat in front of me empty, a seat behind me empty, and a seat on either side of me empty. And um, that remained for quite some time, if not the whole summer. Uh, no one ever tried to sit in my seat, I mean, but I was there early pretty much every time, you know. 
uh, that did not happen in the, my English class because I took two classes. Either the word got around, but everyone took a seat as they came in, but they still left the seat in front behind on either side. Mm -hmm. um, most of, later in the fall, I did register with everyone else and I went to class. There was still an issue of sitting beside you because mm -hmm. if there was no seat to leave vacant, they would sit this way, you know, and you're here. And I don't know how the one on the other side was able to see everything because <laughs> they were facing the other. I don't know how, this went on for some time, and I, I, but at one point there was a young man who came in one day and he came in and he said, hi, and he smiled and he sat down right beside me. He didn't, and he did not turn away. He didn't talk to me the rest of, of, the, of the time, but, you know, at first I didn't say anything. I was so shocked, you know, but finally I said hi. And after that there was a change, you know. Now I can't say that I felt bitterness. I think there was hurt. I think there was, um, like I say, humiliation, it, it, a wonder of, you know, why is this happening this way? Um, but there was definitely the idea mm -hmm. that I want this to be over mm -hmm. and I'm getting out of here. Uh, at the end of the summer, the other young man left. He did not stay, so that put me here by myself for the first full year. Um, and it was not an easy year, but I'm glad mm -hmm. I stayed. And um, looking at all of you here today, I know <coughs> it was worthwhile okay. that I did stay. Uh, but not bitterness. Uh, one question, uh, Ms. Jesse, you uh, answered this already, but uh, from the rest of the panel, uh, do you, can you explain any other classroom incidences or occurrences that happened while you were doing your collegiate career? I remember one experience, and this is a good one. I was in a music class. I've forgotten the teacher's name. And she told the class that we had to go to Paris, Tennessee to observe some music class there. As soon as she said it, I said to myself, where is on earth is Paris, Tennessee, and how am I going to get there? So I was sitting there wondering and thinking. So a lady, she was an older lady. She was married. She had children. She came over to me and she said, Beverly, you're going to ride with us. Oh, well, that's a good feeling when she said that. I said, oh, thank you so much. So it was, I rolled up with her, she drove the car, and two of her friends went along. And they were married later, so I really enjoyed that trip to Paris, Tennessee. I do not remember those ladies' names. I wish I could remember their names, but I don't. One of the students who was in attendance, Siobhan Anderson, responded about her experience. I felt like it was an honor and a blessing. I'm a double minority, Mexican and black, and I felt being around a minority, the first African-American student to attend UT Martin, and hear her story and how my problems aren't, you know, that hard. Like, she had to go through all of that just to get here. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this class is hard. But when you look back at what she had to go through, my problems are just a blessing compared to hers. Many people don't get that opportunity to meet someone like her who made a breakthrough for us. Like there was Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman. But our generation never got to actually meet none of them. So that right there was just an honor. The first event open to the public began at 2 p.m. The dedication of the Unity Circle and unveiling of the benches. During this ceremony, the circle outside of Clement Hall was dedicated as the Unity Circle. The university chose this location because Miss Pryor was the first African American to live in Clement Hall. Also, during the ceremony, the benches that were dedicated in the honorees' names were unveiled. The Brothers of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity and private donations to the university donated both of the benches. The UT Martin Chapter Kappa Alpha Psi was the first African-American Greek fraternity founded on April 15, 1971. I would just like to say thanks to all of you for inviting me to come back. I really have had a wonderful time being here. Thanks so very much.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, afternoon. I am humbled beyond words. I want to pay tribute to Dr. Paul Me because without him, I would not be standing here. He was the first one to contact me and have me enrolled here. And he was the one who checked on me and encouraged me that first lonely year here all by myself. I want to pay tribute to all of the Afro-American students and the staff and faculty who followed me here because they have been the true shepherds of change and the reason we can celebrate today a rich, I would like to say, multicultural heritage here at UTM. I'd like to thank the planning committee, not only for this celebration, but also for this wonderful tribute here. I can only imagine how much work has gone into this. Uh, all of the amazing events and activities that I've been able to attend, talking with the uh, students today, realizing there are 1,000 more here today. In 1961, I was one here. <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing. I think um, all of us search for meaning and purpose in our lives from time to time. And I want to thank you today for giving meaning and purpose to a portion of my life that I sometimes question over the years, was it worth it? And I have to say to all of you today, and seeing this canvas again and being here, yes. It was worth it. After the ceremony, Ms. Pryor was reunited with her high school principal, Reverend Harold Connor. After serving many years in public education, Reverend Harold Connor joined the UT Martin family and became the first African American administrator. First, he served as the director of minority activities. Then, he was hired as the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs for Dr. Philip Watkins. The next event was a reception and photo gallery of 50 photos to represent the 50 years of African American achievement. Everyone circled the room discovering the 50 years of history for themselves. During the event, Dr. Annie C. Jones and Professor Mike McCullough gave a short presentation. Professor McCullough read the Faculty Senate Resolution.
Next, it was time for Thursday night football. Miss Pryor and her family enjoyed a relaxing time watching the football game in the Chancellor's box. It was the first home game of the season. This home game, however, was special because we were honoring one of our guests during halftime. Miss Pryor now lives in North Potomac, Maryland, and is joined today by our family members, son Trevor Pryor with his wife Rebecca of Montgomery Village, Maryland, and son Victor Pryor of North Potomac, Maryland. How about a big Skyhawk welcome for Jesse Lou Arnold Pryor? I think we were about the baby balls back then when she was in school. After a difficult four years of attending school at UT Martin and leaving with little or no fond memories of their time on campus, Miss Pryor and Miss Eccles left the celebration with memories that will make them smile in the years to come. <laughs>